Hello, and welcome to uh, this WMIS uh, webinar brought to you by the Mobile Interest Group and the PET RTRC P41 uh, out of Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I have, we have a great speaker here today, and I'm going to allow Rob Grappler, who's going to be the moderator of this session, uh, introduce the, the speaker. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everyone. Yes, you know, our, our P41 Center, is, uh, its goal is to design new pet radio tracers in collaboration with groups around the country and distribute them amongst experts and continue to disseminate pet technology. So we always, as part of our mission, want to have world's experts in this domain. And we certainly have one today, George Alfakri. And George, thank you. And I don't... You know, it's funny, you introduce people who I think everybody know and knows how good they are, but I'm going to make a short one here, George, and then we'll, we'll move on. Now, Dr. Alfakri is the uh, Nathaniel and Dana Albert Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School and also the founding director of the Gordon Center for Medical Imaging and MGH. I think many of you know, George is just internationally recognized for quantitative imaging and molecular imaging in quantitative analytics, actually, in molecular imaging, and really using multimodality tools, the full translational pathway from cell to man. It's really quite the portfolio. Uh, George is very, very well published, well over you know, 300 papers in highly, highly impactful journals, very well funded, and, was, uh, and has been lauded through new, with numerous um, awards throughout his career. And also, you know, which is important, he's impacting us because he's training the next generation of scientists. He's trained an extensive number of graduate students and postdocs that I'm sure are going to be making as many great um, contributions as George is well right now. And lastly, um, George has also been a great advisor to me because he also has a P41 center that's, I think, about a year older than ours. So I've used him for a lot of advice. So, George, I'm going to stop there and turn the uh, turn this over to you. And again, thank you so much for speaking today. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rob. That's a very kind introduction. Um, I, I'll take it. Thank you. It's a very elogious. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And I think it should be okay. Do this. So are you seeing the full screen or are you seeing the smaller one? Is this okay? Yeah, we're seeing the full screen. Okay, great. So maybe I can start. Uh, so again, thank you, Rob, for the kind introduction. Uh, very thoughtful. Thank you also for the invite. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and it's a pleasure to talk, uh, although it's not in person. and. Uh, getting used to that it's it is an honor to be um, amongst some of the top people in pet uh, washu is has had a distinguished history of uh, pioneering a lot of pet um, so it's a pleasure to be here and i'm happy to be talking also wmis uh, i'll have to learn more about how we can do this uh, here in mgh uh, before i start i would like to also of course acknowledge our, all of our funding agencies and ibib but also uh, nhlbi and um, the gordon charitable trust and unfortunately, I have no conflict of interest to report for this. So that we can move on that one quickly. So I thought maybe before I start, I would give just two slides on who we are for those who, um, who may not know what we do. Uh, and it also helps set the stage for uh, the topic of today, which is imaging membrane potential. Uh, so the Gordon Center for Medical Imaging is really dedicated to, to improving patient care using imaging. It's really focused on translational applications in humans. And while you'll see from my slides that a lot of the work we're doing starts from cell all the way to humans, at the end, it has to end in humans. Otherwise, we consider that it's not you know, a translational application in our center. There are many other centers that do more uh, basic science. In our case, we, we like to push things to humans. Uh, and we do that by looking at you know um, novel molecular agents, exactly like uh, Rob was uh, mentioning about new uh, pet radio tracers and uh, look at those in diagnosis and therapy as well as in other modalities other than PET-NMR. Uh, 
we have grown over the years. Uh, our, my last count, we're 164. I know that you know we're in the annual career evaluation, so I know that we have exactly 49 faculty because that's how many evaluations we have this summer. Uh, and uh, we were created in 2015 from an endowment from the Gordon Foundation. Before that, we were the radiological sciences group where um, center where Gordon Brownell was directing that and where the initial work in uh, positron emission imaging happened. Uh, at, at a time, you know, a little earlier and then co-timing co with uh, another giant was at WashU uh, uh, as well, so uh, Terpicos. And so those two were uh, very similar uh, in their uh, gianthoods, I would say. Uh, and um, uh, this is so where a lot of the positron imaging started, but also some of the future back projection and uh, cardiac gating, all all of which are pertinent actually to what we'll be talking about today. So I thought it was interesting to introduce that. Uh, what we do is uh, we start, we, we span the whole range from uh, cell culture and mice to, uh, and that's of interest to WMIS probably, the uh, mice and rat rodents. Uh, we do rabbits for liver models and uh, cancer models for uh, woodchucks, for those who don't know, an excellent liver cancer model, uh, sheep, pigs, non-human primates, and of course, men. And, and we pride ourselves that we uh, serve a large community of, uh, of users. We do about 1,500 studies a year, everywhere from psychiatry, neurology, uh, to pulmonary care, cancer uh, center, radiation oncology, sports medicine, uh, and, and surgery. Uh, we are quite active, more than sometimes I would like to uh, be, in terms of... Um, uh, compounds. There are about 18 active INDs right now and 40 um, active IRBs. Uh, 20 compounds in med that are done uh, day in, day out. Uh, and all this under GMP radiopharmacy facilities. So as you know, this has become uh, more and more stringent uh, under FDA oversight and all of this is under uh, current GMP. Uh, we scan and you'll see a lot of those results today on uh, PET CT and PET MR. We have a new PET MR coming in next year, as well as a brain scanner with a one millimeter, approaching one millimeter, 1.1 millimeter uh, resolution in the brain. Uh, so uh, this is the, I would say, the facilities kind of thing. The more important piece is the people. Here are the people. Uh, so there are uh, 17 labs, and those labs range in, in what they do from uh, cardiac physiology, uh, the kind of things we're talking about today, that uh, Nat and I do in pharmacokinetics to uh, radiochemistry uh, for brain, uh, Pedro Brigarolas, uh, radiochemistry in uh, Parkinson and other uh, uh, autism, uh, Lisa Brunel, bioengineering nanomedicine with optical imaging, Haxley Choi, a lot of imaging in aging Alzheimer's disease, but also prodromal AD, Keith Johnson, Risa Sperling, nanoparticle imaging with Moses Wilkes, and, and the list goes on, optical uh, computer tomography, et cetera. You see, there's a quite wide range. Uh, our home still PET, and you'll see that many of those have the word PET in them, PET detection instrumentation, guided therapy, uh, but there are other areas also that faculty have branched in. So the topic of my uh, presentation today is uh, on imaging membrane potential. And uh, the word that may be missing from the title, at least for now, is mitochondria. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, you know, mitochondria is the only thing we have taken from other organisms we kept um, over millions of years of evolution. And in one voxel of a, at least a pet voxel, so let's say about a two by two by two millimeter uh, voxel, you will have about, uh, you know, 100 million uh, cells and about 100 billion mitochondria. Uh, and each of those mitochondria will have about 10,000 electron transport chain. So why is the mitochondria so important? It's because the mitochondria is involved in the production of the chemical energy that we need for the cellular biochemical and biomechanical reactions. And that is mainly done through the uh, phosphorylation of the uh, adenosine uh, diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate. That's something we probably all learned in biochemistry in high school or uh, in college. So we're always told that you know the mitochondria is uh, the power uh, cell for uh, the battery for life, right? Uh, why is this interesting to us? Because these redox reactions that take place along the electron transport chain. Uh, those are uh, related to protons that are translocated across the inner membrane. 
from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. And when that happens, there's a proton motive force that, that takes place uh, that uh, I call here delta PM. Uh, and it's mainly formed of the membrane potential delta psi M, which is the mitochondria. So the mitochondria membrane potential is what drives the cell membrane potential for the largest part. Uh, and that ele uh, electra electric gradient, you may think about it if you had a probe that you could put a, a voltmeter that you could put outside the cell and inside the cell or inside the cell and then within the mitochondria, you'll see a difference in voltage. And that's what we're trying to measure. That's the delta psi M. Uh, and this is at the very core of the mitochondrial energy production. That's what is fueling the conversion of ADP to ATP. All right, so the electron transport chain uh, is very sensitive to oxidizing agents. Uh, and the reactive oxygen species uh, induces dysfunction in the electron transport chain. And that dysfunction results in a decreased membrane potential and increased reactive oxygen species, which then re results in you know, more dysfunction. And therefore, this is a, it's a positive loop. Uh, the membrane potential is surprisingly stable, incredibly stable. We've measured hundreds of pigs and now humans and and you'll see that from the results that it's something that is usually pretty constant. And uh, the uh, inner membrane anion channels that we call the IMAC here is uh, in the much counter inner me membrane and the uncoupling are activated when you have that reactive oxygen species and that activates uh, more uh, further dissipation of the delta psi M. So not only you're gonna have reduction through the membrane, uh, through the ROS, but also uh, that positive loop is gonna have lead to more and more decrease of that delta psi M. So our hypothesis that looking at that, and I'll show you several examples of where that works very, very well, uh, is looking at a canary in the mine, a very early uh, upstream event that uh, tells you about the health of the cell and uh, how well the energy plant is working. Uh, all right, so why is this important in disease? First, in the heart, cardiac mitochondrial function has a key role in several cardiovascular pathologies. Uh, the obvious one are heart failure, especially HFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, arrhythmia, and that's one we're studying, reperfusion in injury due to the ROS component, and the chemotherapy induced cardiotoxicity. And I'll show examples of those. I'll show the cardiotoxicity and some of the uh, uh, heart failure. Uh, the reason is because if you look at the uh, non-invasive measurement that you could do with PET, that can give you a biomarker of the very early on uh, changes. And then also an idea of whether um, therapy is uh, acting or not, uh, is effective or not. Uh, specifically, for example, in cardiotoxicity, which we'll look at in, in detail a little later, um, the PET changes precede changes in ejection fraction by several weeks. Uh, and so being able to tell early on that a patient under, under etrocycline is starting to have changes in membrane potential and therefore you know, should move to another therapy is crucial as opposed to uh, you know, uh, a recent 29-year-old who had a drop injection fraction to 30 from 50. So um, uh, when you've waited long enough. So th there's clearly value in looking at this very early on. Uh, now, how do we do this? Well, this was done before with uh, treated compounds. So uh, triphenylphosphonium uh, had been uh, uh, labeled uh, with uh, treated compound. Uh, Triphenylphosphonium is a lipophilic ca uh, cation. Uh, so basically it distributes inside and outside the cell within an equilibrium, and then it goes within the intermembrane space to the uh, mitochondria. And the, the, the ratio, or the, at the equilibrium, the ratio of the concentrations between the uh, extracellular and intermembrane uh, distribution uh, is governed by the Nernst equation circa 1904. Uh, which basically tells you that uh, if you look at the uh, membrane potential, the voltage, uh, uh, this is a constant uh, times the log of the concentration outside versus inside. Uh, 
So if you could measure that membrane potential, uh, you would have an idea of what that is. And uh, I think one thing I'm showing you here is that that voltage is, uh, you know, the concentrations are dramatically, uh, uh, there's a big gradient as you go in uh, into the uh, matrix of the intermembrane space. So what we developed was an F18 compound uh, that labels triphenylphosphonium. Uh, and you know, I'll show you the results of work with that in animals and humans. Ironically, this was initially developed as um, a blood flow. The idea was to have an F18 blood flow agent, uh, except that the ejection, uh, the ejection, the extraction fraction was very low. So it didn't lend itself to be a good uh, flow agent, uh, although it is partially driven by flow. But uh, what was more interesting was that you realized that it was uh, a triple, it's a lipophilic cation that has a triple positive. So that, that lended perfectly to the measurement of the membrane potential. So uh, one of those serendipitous uh, discoveries. And um, the way we use the nurse equation to relate the uh, triphylophosphonium to the volume of distribution um, is, is as follows. We assume that you know, if you have a voxel, you're gonna have a component that is the plasma, then this is the typical kinetic modeling we do day in, day out. Uh, many of you do this in your own uh, research or clinic. Uh, we assume there's an interstitial space. Uh, the cytosol and the mitochondria are loop, uh, lumped together into an intracellular space. We lump also the extracellular space as a one, one space. I, I stress the extracellular space because that is a part we need to know in order to have the volume distribution, because you need to know what is the uh, fraction of the extracellular space. What's the fraction of mitochondria, meaning how much mitochondria do you have per, per cell? And both of those, or within a volume, how much of it is mitochondria? And both of those are uh, kind of subject specific, meaning when you're young, your extracellular space is small. As you get older, your extracellular space becomes bigger. If you're diabetic, it gets bigger. If you have dyslipidemia, it gets better, uh, it gets bigger. Uh, and same for mitochondria. So uh, given, um, your health, those, those values will change. So you can't use those for everybody to be the same. Uh, all right, and, and this part is what we measure with MR because we can't measure that with PET. Uh, you can, we measure it also with CT, with real energy CT. Uh, and this is one of those uh, interesting uh, stories of uh, cases where you need the PET and the MR to be measured ideally together because you know it's a lot easier or maybe within a very short time, uh, but more interestingly together so that you can measure the volume distribution while you know what the extracellular space that you need to uh, in incorporate into your kinetic model to measure your uh, membrane potential. And if you knew those, then you would be able to get your uh, delta psi, which is uh, what we're looking for. Now, the, I, I keep talking about membrane potential. I'm not specifying. There are two components to the membrane potential, the cellular and the mitochondrial. We are currently looking in this the version of the P41 at the cellular membrane potential, uh, which has a whole set of applications in, uh, for example, the diabetes. But, but you know, for this talk, we'll be concentrating on the uh, mitochondrial component, which is the biggest part and the easiest part to, to, to measure. So uh, for the rest of this will be delta psi -M. So uh, here's the uh, first in vivo quantitative studies we did in pigs. We started with five controls and four with the scar-like injury that was created over time. Uh, and in this case, we were, sorry, in this case, we were doing a bolus. Uh, and then uh, we did full dynamic studies over two hours. You measure the uh, the volume distribution, you have a tier sampling, and you do the full model. And, and the membrane potential we measured was about minus 130, minus 129, which is in very good agreement uh, with the literature. That's you know what, what people have re reported. The interesting piece is not only that, well, you can measure a membrane potential in millivolts, the units here are in millivolts, but also that the values are pretty tight in the control. If you look at the control group, uh, these are different pigs, different size pigs, different age, and they're still, you know, quite tight in terms of what you're measuring. Uh, there's variability in the injured, of course, because there, uh, there are two things happening. One is you don't know how much mitochondria you have because the cells are dying. And then the ones you have, you don't know how healthy they are. So you don't know how much uh, voltage they're driving. So both of those uh, introduce the variability in the injured, which is what you'd expect. And then uh, here's uh, 
the second step of what we did, uh, validating the bolus with uh, uh, the initial full dynamic with a bolus plus infusion. The idea for this is that uh, as we move, uh, and remember, we want to translate this into patients. So at the end of the day, we want to have this in humans. The idea of having, as much as we love it, to have somebody in a scanner for two and a half hours with arterial sampling is not something we do regularly in the clinic. Actually, we never do this in the clinic. So the way we see the kinetic modeling is the first needed step and then come up with a more simplified method for when you're going to be doing your, um, your actual studies. So the idea here was, okay, well, if there's a way we could do a bolus and then a constant infusion, then you could do that outside the scanner. And then when you reach equilibrium, well, then you can have the patient come in for a, a single fast scan and, uh, and you'd be able then to, to get all the information you need. So that would make the human studies feasible. So the idea was to use a comparison of a secular equilibrium versus the full kinetic analysis that remains the reference. So here we did seven Yucatan pigs, uh, and uh, within 10 days, the two studies, uh, and we did two studies, one with bolus plus infusion, one full modeling. Uh, we did those on a PET CT, and uh, we did two hours of dynamic imaging with arterial sampling, and then we measured the extractions, uh, the uh, extracellular space pre and post iodine scanning in this case. And we did both with MR and with CT, so uh, we've been comparing those. We analyzed this, uh, all this data using the Logan uh, graphical analysis and secular approach, uh, where you can have the concentration ratios between tissue and plasma uh, at uh, about two hours. So here's some of the results, and you can see that uh, there's a, as far as in vivo studies go, uh, there's a very good agreement uh, in, in all animals we did. Uh, all normal areas were normal, uh, were normal, and the values were in a very tight range. Uh, between Logan and Secular, which were acquired on different times. So this is very, very uh, reassuring. It means that, you know, uh, this is reproducible. Uh, if a tracer is not reproducible, there's very little you can do uh, in terms of uh, assessment of response to treatment, for example. Uh, here's the quantitation in terms of volume of distribution measured with the Secular Carrium versus uh, Logan. And uh, again, you know, these are... Uh, in vivo studies in live uh, pigs, but uh, excellent uh, agreement. Uh, the R square was about 0 0.88 or 0 0.85, uh, 0.86. Uh, and this is looking at Logan versus secular curvium um, uh, in, in these animals. So, you know, this is very reassuring, both for the volume distribution and for the uh, membrane potential. All right. And then uh, the next step was to look at validating that what we're measuring is actually the membrane potential. Uh, it was a very interesting story because when we started this and we, we published the first works, uh, some of the reviewers said, well, you know, uh, how do you know you're measuring the uh, membrane potential really? Uh, and after all this work that I'll show now, uh, we saw another paper and a reviewer said, well, of course you're measuring the membrane potential. Everybody knows that, that's what you measure. So uh, it was an interesting experience, but between the two, that was the proton uncoupler. So, uh, let me walk you through what is this exactly. What we're doing here is we want to do a controlled experiment where we can show that, sorry, where we can show that if we modify the membrane potential in a localized area, and we know how, then uh, we will see a change on PET. So the pharmacological uncouplers uh, is what we use, and these are small molecules that mimic the actions of uncoupling proteins. You remember the UCPs we saw earlier on the membrane? They enable protons to enter the mitochondria matrix, so it causes a, the, um, a change in the voltage, uh, depolarization, uh, along the concentration and electrochemical gradient that we have. Uh, an alternative approach to decreasing food intake or absorption is to decrease the metabolic efficiency, so whereby the food is converted into useful energy. And, and this was the idea here. Small molecule mitochondrial uh, proton-4 uncouplers can decrease the membrane potential and result in a nutrient oxidation that produces a, a certain amount of ATP. So the idea was, okay, if we did this, can we measure then um, in those uh, eucantan pigs a change in signal? So we took four new eucantan pigs. Uh, we placed uh, a catheter in the proximal uh, LED just to make sure that we are uh, only... Um, reaching one to cardiac territory. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in the first two animals, we, uh, we used the dose titration uh, and we imaged in PET. So uh, 
remember we did the LEDs, so it's the uh, uh, septolateral uh, wall that we're looking uh, we're looking at here, and uh, we infused BAM uh, the uncoupler uh, at this point, and you can see that you know the membrane potential now. Uh, so the pet, well, in this case, the pet activity, and we'll see membrane potential in a minute. The pet activity went down, and then when we stopped infusing, it went back up. Uh, whereas if you look at uh, another, instead of looking at the uh, interceptual, if you looked at the, say, the infralateral segment here, uh, you would see that the activity continued uh, to continue uh, up unchanged, because remember, we're in the infusion phase uh, of, our, of our study. Uh, so unchanged activity. So that tells you that only in the area where we injected the uncoupler, we saw a change in a PET, and that tells you then that PET is, uh, the TPP kappa is measuring the membrane potential. So this is the in vivo molecular validation that you measure the membrane potential. Uh, this is the uh, volume distribution and the membrane potential now uh, uh, that validate the, the proton uncoupler uh, uh, experiment, and you can see that, I'm sorry, this keeps jumping. Uh, the interceptual uh, uh, area is reduced, whereas the rest of the mycodium has not been affected, both in terms of bond distribution, but also in terms of membrane potential. So with that, in uh, strong with that, equipped with that, we were ready to go for humans. So we did our uh, IND, first in human studies. Uh, four letters said like this quickly, it usually takes a little longer, but once that was approved, uh, we started with 14 healthy volunteers and there, uh, we started imaging them on the PET-MR because remember, we want to have the uh, extracellular space uh, measured at the same time. Uh, we did bolus, uh, bolus followed by infusion for 120 minutes and you know we imaged the whole time uh, so that we would have a reference for future comparisons. Uh, and we did a 60 minute acquisition uh, one hour after bolus and then the last 30 minutes we used to calculate the volume distribution because then we're in secular equilibrium. So uh, this is, the uh, typical results in terms of uh, the time activity curves in myocardium and blood when you're uh, out at 90 minutes on that confirms that you're in secular equilibrium. So that's good. That means we can we can now use a simplified method. Uh, and we measured the extracellular space using a T1 mapping approach where uh, now it's a 3D uh, sequence where you measure the T1 mapping of the entire throat. Uh, well, through... Um, 15 slices of the heart or 16 slices of the heart with a pre and post GATO uh, T1 mapping sequence that was developed uh, in the P41 actually. Here's an example actually of uh, three slices of those where you can see the extracellular volume uh, measured, uh, computed from the T1 and T2 uh, from the sequence, I'm sorry, T1 pre GAD and, uh, and uh, post GAD. Uh, and, and this is the average over uh, the extraction fraction. Uh, that was measured over uh, all the pigs. And you see that, uh, I'm sorry, over all the humans, uh, over the uh, 14 humans. And you see that, you know, there is some variability. Uh, it, it's pretty constant. These were healthy volunteers, but it, it's small, but there is some variability. So you, you do want to measure that. Uh, and it was about uh, the um, about 0 0.3 with a range of a 0, 0, 0.03 uh, in, in, in change. So here's some of the uh, images. That's uh, volume distribution and membrane potential in humans. Again, this is uh, millivolts. So that was the very first image we had in millivolts of uh, membrane potential. And you see the range is quite tight uh, as we had expected in normal volunteers. So that's good. It's good to see that uh, the predictions are correct. Uh, it's about a minus 60 and plus or minus five millivolts. And this is again, very much in range with uh, with what physiology books, uh, textbooks teach us about uh, about uh, membrane protection. So I'm going to switch now gears and talk about one of the first applications for this, uh, and uh, looking at cardiotoxicity uh, with Dr. Rubison, uh, measuring uh, by looking at uh, the membrane potential uh, as uh, throughout that treatment. So, as I said, alluded to that earlier when we started the talk. Uh, you know, cardiotoxicity is one of the big issues, especially in uh, women with breast cancer who's going through an intracycline treatment. Uh, it remains one of the big uh, side effects for chemotherapy. They, there's, a, there's a very high percentage, about 30%, who uh, suffer from uh, 
uh, cardiotoxicity and then reduced ejection fraction. Some of them see a, a revert of that and they come back to normal, many don't. So, um, so you know, the result, end result is uh, the patient would be cured from cancer and then they suffer from heart failure for, for many years later. So it's not uh, that great of, a, of an outcome. So the idea is, uh, well, is there a way um, we could predict uh, early on, uh, it, weeks, weeks earlier, uh, if we are getting down that path, and then in that case, you would change treatment to a more expensive treatment, but they would be warranted in this case because uh, the patient would have to under, to uh, suffer heart failure otherwise. And, and that would be where the imaging would happen with the mitochondrial uh, uh, membrane potential. So instead of going this path and uh, you know monitoring the ultrasound uh, with echo, what you would have here is you'd have a, a PET scan that would tell you whether or not the membrane potential is changing. And if that is the case, then you weeks before you would you would switch something else. And to validate that, of course, that you know you're you're detecting something very early on, we're gonna come back again to pigs this time and we're gonna you know follow them for a period of time and then we're gonna show that you can predict it. And that's the work that we're doing currently. Uh, so um, so we wanna show that you know uh, we want to assess whether acute cardiotoxic effect can be detected with uh, uh, with membrane potential uh, TPP PET uh, after a doxorubicin infusion. So uh, the idea is, again, we come back now to pigs, eight pigs again. Uh, these pigs will have uh, an injection of, um, uh, they will have an injection of, uh, of uh, doxorubicin. Uh, we will administer the tracer through bolus infusion like we did before. Uh, and then, uh, and we'll place a catheter without impeding any blood flow. And, you know, after 90 minutes of uh, infusion of TPP, once we are at equilibrium, uh, we will inject then, we'll infuse um, saline into the LAD, followed by DOX infusion in the LAD, and then uh, nothing else in the other territory, so that we will have, again, uh, uh, nested control comparing the uh, LAD to the rest of the myocardium. So, you know, schematically, it's you have your TPP. Once you reach your equilibrium, uh, you have your docs. And then you should see here a change in uh, membrane potential if the hypothesis is correct in the LAD. And then you shouldn't see anything elsewhere. So, here's the results from the um, mapping of early detection for cardiotoxicity. Uh, this is uh, segment 13. So, uh, we're here in the uh, uh, anteroceptal uh, wall, and you see that, uh, let's go back here. So this is the blue saline and, and orange is uh, docs. So once you have your saline here, nothing. When you have your docs, you see the uh, immediate decrease in the membrane potential. And uh, once we stop, it stays at a pretty low uh, level. Uh, I don't know if we, you remember this. I'll try to come back to that. But when we looked at the uncouplers, which had a very quick effect, um, you had an effect going down. And then when you stopped, it came back because, you know, there's no, uh, nothing, the myocytes are not seeing anything anymore. In the case of the uh, cardiotoxicity, it's very interesting because you're seeing now uh, when the cells come back, they don't come back to where they were in terms of membrane potential. It, 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 it comes back up, it recovers, but not exactly the same level. Uh, same in, in, in a different segment here, uh, both of those irrigated by the LED uh, in the interior and interceptal. If you look now at the inferior wall where you don't see any uh, doxorubicin, uh, when the doxorubicin is injected in the LED, there's no change. Here. So you know, this is good, nothing's changing, we're happy. So that, that's very good because that means you know, we, we can measure it and those changes uh, are small. If you look at this, you're going from, you know, in, in time activity curve units, you're going down one unit. So about, you know, 20%, 15%. So we can measure that, that's, that's good. And it's not too small that you can't measure uh, with enough accuracy with PET. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, horizontal long axis uh, that uh, we got from, uh, a section where the saline is infused and one where the dox is infused, and you can see the clear 
uh, reduction in the membrane potential. Again, these are absolute values in the default um, in the uh, interceptal, whereas the rest of the myocardium is normal. Uh, and um, and if you um, and so and the good thing here is you're using the animals as their own controls. So you can compare one area to the other. So none of the other physical factors uh, intervene. And that's important because then you can confer, you know, assert that the drop in membrane potential is due to the uh, docs and nothing else. So the hypothesis that we tested, uh, we tested that uh, the plant contrast within linear mixed model. So uh, while taking into account the repeated measures in the same animal to, to make sure that we uh, statistically capture that. And you see that the change in the, the membrane potential uh, with the docs infusion um, was significantly different from the changes uh, after the Sabine infusion uh, with a P that is highly significant. Uh, even when you take different effect uh, uh, for LAD versus non-LAD segments into account. So for the segments directly exposed to the docs, the membrane potential was partially depolarized, depolarized sorry, and much smaller uh, changes often in the opposite direction uh, occurred in the other segments. Uh, and that's because, you know, you're, you're infusing still activity. So you would see a little more. So that means that the change is probably even more than what we see, slightly more than what we see in the areas uh, that saw the docs, the docs service in versus the others. So uh, armed with that, now we've started a new study. We started this actually uh, only a couple of uh, weeks ago when we finally had a pen for ourselves, because now we are doing chronic cardiotoxicity, and uh, next Wednesday will be the final scan of our first pig. So these are pigs that having the exact same regimen of doxorubicin as uh, women uh, with breast cancer having uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we scan them before treatment and then after treatment at uh, as they're having the treatment at uh, um, regular intervals while you're doing also all of the echo and other uh, uh, other sampling uh, and you know eventually would have also the by uh, the uh, we'll have a radiography and then we'll have also uh, uh, pathology so we'll be able to uh, map all of those areas we're measuring now into what is in the heart so uh, that is to be uh, to be continued because we, we literally haven't finished our first pig yet. We've just, uh, we're doing our last scan on our first pig uh, next Wednesday. But, but that's, um, that's a very complex study because, you know, these pigs first have to live and they don't always, uh, you know, uh, do well with uh, chemo. Uh, they cannot be with any other pigs because now they have, you know, they have chemo uh, therapies in the system and they have to be followed a lot. And you know, Robin, Everybody at Rush U, but everybody else who does um, PET imaging know how expensive that is. That's the only way to assert at what time can you really see a change in membrane potential that is significant, and how early is that compared to the um, downstream changes that you're going to see with ejection fraction and with uh, uh, ventricle enlargement uh, that you see uh, later. Uh, so the idea here, what we're trying to quantify is how much time do you, do you, can you gain by doing this compared to um, uh, measuring the, uh, with the tools that are available today. All right, so that brings me to uh, the summary. So I hope I've convinced you that we've developed uh, one of the first methods to map the cardiac membrane potential in vivo. And I, I know that, you know, Washu is also working on something similar and it's, I'm very excited about that because these are the kind of studies you want to have multiple tracers and multiple approaches because it's a very import, important target. And I hope that you'll have more and more recognition in the field uh, of the value in uh, not only in, in precision medicine, kind of trying to figure out which patient to get what treatment, but also in precision health on the longer term, because that can tell you very, a lot about uh, the health of the myocyte. Uh, so it's, it's uh, very exciting that several groups are now working on this. We're very happy with that. Uh, we validated the bolus plus infusion protocol, which simplifies the imaging. Now for humans, we, we do an infusion. They come into the scanner only for 20 minutes uh, or 15 minutes. They don't have to be the whole time. Uh, we have demonstrated that the cardiac uptake depends on the membrane potential and that any change in the membrane potential results in a, uh, in a proportional change in the membrane potential, in a log proportional change in membrane potential. Uh, we've done the first human studies, and now we have shown also that 
uh, you can look at uh, the impact of uh, chemotherapy, uh, doxorubicin-induced cardiotoxicity with, uh, uh, with changes in membrane potential due to, uh, uh, due to the chemotherapeutic agent. So uh, with that, I would like to first acknowledge the uh, membrane potential team. It takes a village for this kind of studies. As you can tell, they're very, uh, very heavy and very involved. Uh, whether it's the human studies or the animal studies, uh, these pigs have to live for a long period of time while having all sorts of treatments. And I glossed over a lot of that in terms of uh, when we cause uh, 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 heart failure in a pig or when we cause a, uh, a scar or when we give them chemo and then they have to, uh, to survive that. But uh, that's the work that um, uh, the team has developed a, an incredible skill at. Uh, uh, there are many, many people to recognize. Matt Alpert, with whom I've had the pleasure of working now for, for 20 years. Uh, Matt Matugal Arnaud, who was a cardiologist who worked with us for several years and who still works with us back in Montreal and who uh, was uh, instrumental in some of these experiments. Felicitas, who've taken over, and, and many, many others. Uh, Tim Shoup, who developed the tracer, and uh, David Almanet, uh, Mark Norman, who was leading a lot of this as well. So uh, I think this talk would not be complete if I don't recognize, obviously, the uh, the folks who make this happen, which is um, uh, the funding agencies. So we're incredibly uh, thankful to the NIH, uh, the NIBIB for the P41, uh, as Rob mentioned. Um, we're one of the three uh, pet-focused, uh, three or four pet or pet or four, I think, uh, nationally, uh, as well as you know other institutes, the Heart and Lung and Blood. Institute of Institute and Aging and EBA and NIBIB, of course. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I am happy to take any questions you may have. And uh, I couldn't help, uh, well, I have to yield to pressure from many of our faculty saying, please, please let them know that, you know, we have several positions open. So there are several openings for postdoctoral fellows as well as faculty at uh, different levels in reconstruction, AI, kinetic modeling, radiochemistry, image processing. You know, there's a very wide range of openings. So if you're interested, please contact us and would love to have you come and join us. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I think it's a complicated process. I have to, we have to close now and then we'll have to go to a website. Well, hold on, George. I think we got, yeah, thank you. So we have some questions in the Q&A. So I think I'll read those to you. But before we do, I just want to make one, first I want to thank George for a phenomenal talk. That's a real tour de force, making a tracer from mouse to man and, and whatnot. Um, also, I'd just like to add to anyone looking for positions, please stop in St. Louis first before you go to Boston. Okay, there's a lot we have going for us there, here. But there are there are a few questions before you go to the, the uh, chat room. Um, Jordan, when you're talking about your initial validation, your pig model, one question was asked, uh, what was the type of injury and how were the equilibrium values achieved and how did the values change over time? Okay, so, uh... The initial injury was uh, ligation with not a full ligation, but partial ligation, where you, you mm -hmm. insert a kind of a rod, partial ligation, and then you release that. Uh, and then at that point, there was flow re, uh, reestablished. So it wasn't the lack of signal was not because, and I think I mentioned that in some of the slides, was not because there was no flow. It was because there was injury uh, to show that the membrane potential was affected. Uh, that was for the initial ligation. For the BAM, that was through, um, uh, uh, you know, delivering the, uh, in the LAD uh, while making sure that it's patent and then, you know, bringing it out after, uh, after insertion to make sure that, you know, when you imaged, again, the flow was all normal uh, to the specific uh, territory. In terms of the constancy of the, val uh, the values, we've done repeated values. I think I showed that at the beginning. It is remarkably reproducible. So, um, so the, this is very important because that, uh, that's what allowed us then to have strong, uh, strong uh, statistical differences between normal and injured because the normal variations were small. Okay, good. Uh, same question comes from Vijay Sharma from here, who's obviously working in a similar area. He asks, when the mitochondria depolarize, how does a residual uptake of your tracer, what is the residual uptake of your tracer under those conditions after the depolarization? Uh, do you think the residual, what do you think of the residual uptake under those conditions? How would it impact the subsequent measurements? 
Does that make sense? I'm not sure I understand. Let me repeat that. Is the question yeah. after depolarization? How much is residual? Better? How is the residual uptake of your transfer yeah. under those conditions? Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So. With, with when we did depolarization with with BAM with the proton uncoupler on purpose we didn't depolarize it completely because okay. otherwise we would have uh, sacri you know uh, lost the animal. Um, it, they did recover. Okay. We did not. Uh, VJ, this is a good question. We did not do a study where we depolarized it completely. So here we. Uh, to see, like you know, do you recover from that? Part of the reason was because that, from a from a physiological point of view, was not something that you know would make would be a common situation. We were actually trying to titrate a small uh, depolarization, see if we're capable of measuring it, because that would be more closer to reality. But we don't have an answer for like if you did a full depolarization, what it would look like. Uh, in this case, there was recovery uh, because it was small. I am not completely convinced that if you had a major depolarization, it would come back perfectly to normal. And the reason is, if you look at the doxorubicin, you see it didn't recover. Okay, thank you. I um, hope that so answers. I'm not sure if I answered completely, but I hope that answers. No, I think I did pretty well. Uh, the third question is actually from Dr. Lowe, who asked the first question. Um, was there a dose dependency for the drop in membrane potential in your docs treated dogs? Or pigs, excuse me, pigs. Was there a dose dependency with what? The, for drop in membrane potential in the docs treated animals. Okay, with doxorubicin or with BAM? Yeah, uh, this is, a, I think, a, Doxorubicin, in other words, yeah. was there more yeah. doxorubicin? Did you get a greater drop? You know, or was there a threshold effect? I think is what they're going after. That's a very good question. So we think there is a dose effect. Uh -huh. We are working on that right now uh, because that's a lot harder to, to titrate. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way we are approaching it is uh, indirectly by thinking like these, do these pigs are having uh, every two weeks, exactly like patients, they're having a, a chemo. So we can calculate what is the cumulative dose that they're seeing. And we're scanning after every one of those. So we could measure uh, uh, an integral dose, if you will, mm -hmm. of docs. And every time, what's the change? I don't think this is a threshold where it's normal and it drops down. It is more of a probably a initial, you don't see anything. And all of a sudden you start seeing a linear effect after a while. Right. And the last question I'll, I'll ask myself, I know you said this tracer has a fairly low first pass extraction, so the, it's not much of a flow tracer, but is the first pass extraction high enough that you need to measure flow in addition to the kinetics of this tracer to fully understand it? Yes, that's a very good uh, inner baseball question. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we worry about this a lot with a lot of the... Uh, um, brain agents because you know there's a flow uh, dependence unfortunately in this case no the extraction fraction is so low that you know we we've modeled that and it doesn't okay. change much so uh it, it served us for this i mean it didn't serve for being a blood flow agent but uh but it, you know for this i don't think so we haven't seen much of an effect there. Okay. great but it's a very good question this is something every kinetic model should look at when they're doing a new tracer because the blood flow part is an important component well, great. Well, Jordan, thank you so much. This is a phenomenal lecture. Um, we're going to close this webinar now. For those of you that have other questions for George, please uh, go to the um, social lounge as part of the webinar, and we'll have that open for a bit to see if there are further questions. But otherwise, uh, the session is now closed. George, again, thank you for just a superb lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Great for, uh, thank you for having me.